Well, good evening, everybody. Uh, oh, yeah, you're, you're going to have to say either you want to be recorded or not, I guess. Uh, but, um, oh, there's Mark. I think, yeah, there's Mark. Yep. Hey, Mark. You have to agree to be recorded or you get kicked hey, off. Mark. It's your <laughs> it's their way or the highway. I guess so. <laughs> hey, Mark, oh, how beautiful you know. lake of yours. Hey, Gail has a question for you, Mark. Shoot. How's that beautiful lady of yours? She's she's recovering. We had the operation yesterday. Oh, okay. So we Thank came back home this morning. So whew, woman body, I tell you. you, you <laughs> man, no, we don't understand what they go through, man. Oh my. <laughs> well, Poor give baby. her our love. I will, I will. Okay. Thank God. We've been but the, the the procedure went well? Yeah, and she okay. had it. The stuff they took out. Oh my gosh! Wow, wow. <laughs> well, hey, we'll keep praying, bro. Yeah. So. My best friend had her gallbladder and a hysterectomy done in the same day. Oh my! Poor baby. <laughs> yeah, no, that was a baby, all right. <laughs> they might as well have taken her appendix too. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. Not yeah, yet. well, they were in there. I mean, she just wanted <laughs> to put it all at one time. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Okay, well, then let's go ahead and, and get going. Um, now, as, as we moved over into chapter, what chapter are we in? Uh, yes. Chapter six. six. Okay, there we go. Thank you, Margaret. Thank you all. Okay, chapter six. Um, we've moved on into the seven seals now. As, as we saw last week, I mean, these seals are no small issue, right? I mean, each seal brings out something really significant. Now, you got to remember what this is, this period of time when these judgments are coming. Think about the end times. When Jesus came to the cross, he died for all sin, right? He came, he gave his life for sin. That was what he came to do. And, and through it, he gained dominion and took dominion away from Satan. Now, he didn't take everything away from Satan because otherwise Satan would have been gone. Poof, out of here, you're done, right? But in this case, Satan lost a lot of his power when Jesus died on the cross. He took away the power of sin and death from Satan. Satan had no longer had dominion over sin and death. That came in through Jesus Christ. So when you look at what happened and transpired there, Satan still regrettably, is the prince of the power of the air. He still influences much of what's going on in this world. You know, the whole fallen nature of this world still is under his control in that respect. However, we don't have, people don't have to stay in that. They can come into salvation through Jesus Christ because Jesus paid the price for people to come out of that. To be freed from sin is what Romans 6 talks about, that we can be freed from it and no longer be slaves to sin, but now we're slaves to righteousness. Now, the only reason I bring this up is because we need to understand that the curse in this world still needs to be judged, okay? We've, we've had the problem all the way back from Adam and Eve, right? Everything was nice and pure and wonderful and great. And God had planned it all wonderfully. And then look, we, we blew it because we disobeyed God in the garden, right? The curse happened. And we've been living with that curse all the way from the garden till this time frame of judgment. This time frame of judgment is basically judging the whole cursed issue of the world. Okay, that's what we're looking at with these seals and with the trumpets and with the bull judgments. I mean, in a sense, it's like God saying, okay, now it's time to, you know, to actually address this matter. Because think about it. God would have been righteous if he would have just killed off Adam and Eve as soon as they disobeyed him. I mean, that, that would have been a righteous thing to do because it was like, hey, you know, either me or no, but God gave us free will. And in that free will, we make decisions. All of us make decisions every day. We can either follow the Lord and go by the path of the Holy Spirit for those of us who accepted Jesus Christ as our savior, or we can say, Lord, 
I just want to go have some fun for a while. Just kind of turn your head while I go have some fun, right? We have the free will to do that. It may not please God because we're going doing our own thing and, you know, basically grieving the spirit. But we have that right through our will. Of course, what we want is that we become more like Christ daily to where the old nature stays behind us and we keep focused on what's ahead, which is the Lord Jesus Christ, and we become more like him daily. Well, so now moving ahead and seeing what all of this has caused, God rains down judgment on this fallen world. Okay, this is like he is exacting the judgment that this world deserves. That's why, as we've been going through these judgments, and we got up to number five, right? Look at how serious each one was, right? Remember, the first seal that was broken is the one that introduced the Antichrist. He's the guy that's leading the charge. And the Antichrist, at the point where the judgments start, is Satan and dwell, okay? The first three and a half years, the Antichrist is there. He's this peacemaker, and everybody wants him. Oh, he's the best thing. He's the salvation of this world, and they think this is the guy, right? And then they get to the end of the first three and a half years, and Satan indwells this guy. Supposedly, he, he come, well, not supposedly, he comes back to life. Satan indwells him. So, of course, you know, everybody follows him because he was resurrected, as it were, and now he's indwelt by Satan. And God's judgment is being poured out. Okay, so that's the Antichrist. That's the guy that we're dealing with. And actually, even Jerusalem, you know, starts following him for a while because they say, hey, look at this temple. He'll build our temple for us. And that's, hey, the Jews want that even now, right? They want the Dome of the Rock gone, and they want their temple rebuilt there on the site. As a matter of fact, they're even putting together even today they're putting together the things that the temple was known to house you know like the table of showbread and you know the different lampstands and the things that you know Moses was told to put in the tabernacle basically they put assembling those things to match what the bible talks about so that they will be able to populate the temple they truly are following that way well when the Antichrist tells them, hey, I'll take care of this. You know, there will be peace. You're not going to be peace. There's not going to be a problem with peace. Uh, and we'll put your temple back in. The Jews follow him for a while until they realize <laughs> he's got an agenda, right? And so, <laughs> so in this agenda, when it comes, they are in a pickle, so to speak. We're going to find out in one of the judgments today, one of the seal judgments, what happens, how the Jews come and play in. We'll have a break between a couple of the judgments, and we're going to see what God's plan is with the Jews, how he's going to bring them out in this period of time. In other words, I've always said, keep your eyes on Israel, because I'll tell you, that's where we'll get the biggest signs about the things that are coming. I mean, that's what the Bible was clear about, that the Jews are still playing a pivotal part in history, in future history. Well, I, future history is not, not the right way of saying it, but in the future, they will play just a, a pivotal part as they bring out God's plan. Because God hasn't given up on the Jews, but he's not finished with them. It's not like when Jesus died on the cross, all of a sudden, all the covenants you know, with Israel went away. God is a covenant keeping God. So he's going to fulfill his covenants with the Jews because he made them with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And they are central to God's plan with the Jews. So we'll see that even how it will metastasize and become fully functional in the Jews. We'll look at one of those seals tonight. Uh, well, no, that's not a seal. It's it's a God's plan in between two seals. So as we're looking at this and we look at each individual one, remember, when these, when these judgments are happening, it's the last half of the seven-year period. The first half is a peaceful one. That's where, well, relatively peace. So it's where the world, though, falls in love with this dude, this Antichrist, and 
They say, that's who we want to follow. That, that's the guy that's got the answer to all the questions. He's the guy, but he's got his agenda, right? He wants one, only one form of worship, right? He doesn't want a whole bunch of religions. He wants one, and he's the one that needs to be worshiped, right? But in the first three and a half years, he's not real dogmatic about it. It's that last three and a half years where he's like, hey, <laughs> either you worship me or... And that's where we talk about, you know, getting the, the seal on the right hand or on the forehead, you know, following him, you know, being his. If you don't have it, you can't buy or sell. That all fits into that period of time. So as we're looking at this, we're going to be seeing some really tough stuff. Remember what we talked about last week. Uh, the first seal ushered in the Antichrist. The second seal was the red horse. And remember, it was a great war. Okay, there was a lot of bloodshed, a lot of war, a lot of people dying in this great war. I, I tell you, it like I said last week, it will put World War One and World War Two combined to pale in terms of how devastating it will be. I mean, in terms of the actual war. Um, remember how we talked about that God removes peace, and all of a sudden, then if you remove peace, what's left? anger hostility yes. hate you know so that you know when that happens people nobody's going to care about anybody else they're just going to say man you know i hate you <laughs> and and they'll take action in that hatred towards one another i mean it will be really bad the third one was the global famine now remember what i said before these are things that are going to happen right away. They're not going to take, you know, years for a famine to happen. As soon as God breaks the seal, the famine begins. In other words, anything that's food, basically, for all intents and purposes, is decimated. Okay? It's not going to take a long time because, remember, we're talking to three and a half years that this is happening, right? And so, so, I mean, it's not like it can take, well, you know, a year to two years for the famine finally to kick in because, hey, if, if we did it that way, we're already at the end. No, it, God causes it to happen right away to where all of a sudden everybody has to depend on what they have left. And that's it, you know, and that's where everything starts becoming really expensive. That's food item or anything to survive is going to be expensive because, there's no replacing it. You know, once it's gone, it's gone. So, of course, you know, it's going to be a seller's market for anybody that has any food or that kind of stuff during this famine period. So there's going to be a lot of people die in it, too, because they're just not going to be street smart and able to go out and find stuff and get it. You know what I'm saying? Or they just won't have money to be able to buy it in the first place. So they're just going to go hungry. And then we looked at the fourth one, which was the pale horse which is the one that carried uh, the leader of, oh, oh, I'm sorry, on the global famine one, remember, that was the black horse with the rider that had the scales, okay? Now, the fourth one is the pale horse where the rider is death. He's called death. And uh, we see with him that there's also going to be um, a, a quarter, uh, there's going to be uh, in that death, a quarter of the earth population will die. A quarter. You know, think of uh, right now we have about close to 8 billion people on the earth. Think about that. That's 2 billion people that just in one of the judgments, you know, in the process, right? So however it happens in war or in function, the bottom line is, man, let's say if it was to happen today, 2 billion people would die. I mean, we're not talking 600,000 with COVID or something. We're talking 2 billion. And that's I mean, within that three years, right? Oh, yeah. That's that's Jesus. actually within the three and a half years that all this is happening. That's, that's, that's enormous. I'm that's telling you, it's that's, it, that's judgment. Yeah. <laughs> You're but, still going to smell it because it will oh, have time to bury all those people. No way. Exactly. Imagine... Imagine that's what people will be doing. That'll be their job is just trying to get rid of these dead bodies. I mean, they're going to have, you know, uh, uh, equipment out there just digging these mass graves and throwing people into them because otherwise there's going to be more disease and everything from it, 
which will kill more people. You know, it's 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 not going to be pretty. So that's a, what's that, Victor? A huge fire. Oh, I, I'm not so sure that's always the best way, because sometimes that just propagates some problems, you know, um, especially if you have that many bodies. You know, it's I mean, it's not like. Uh, it's not like a few bodies that you're burning in a pyre, but when you got that many bodies, how, you know, it's, well, it's, it's bad. Let's just put it this way. It's bad. <laughs> and you can see that God's judgment though is right because I mean, he's, he's addressing all the things that this whole fallen world finally is getting the judgment it deserves. Okay. Because think about it. How many, how many, as if we're saying that from Adam to today is 8,000, 9,000 years, somewhere in that range, that's how long this fallen nature of this world has been around and God's been holding back his judgment. Think about it. That's a lot of judgment. You know what I'm saying? And so we see that judgment being carried out at the end. And that's what we're looking at today. So that's the introduction. Any questions or comments as we proceed now with the fifth seal and let's see if it, it gets cushy if they're going to have a party all of a sudden <laughs> not as like as christians we should be gone right uh well that is another uh, a matter because see if you if you understand the bible to say that there is a rapture at the beginning okay just before the tribulation starts the seven years of tribulation then the church will be gone. Yes, they'll be with Christ. But the issue is, is that what will happen is that the people, let's say that are left behind. You know, if you read like the Tim LaHaye and Jerry B. Jenkins book series, he calls it the left behind people. In other words, these are people that thought they were saved, but they really had never turned their lives over to the Lord. They thought maybe they thought they did. But in his books, he takes it to the extent that he says, well, what will happen is that when this happens and the people are gone, they'll know what happened. They'll be like, well, we knew that this was coming and that there was going to be this taking of the church. And if I'm still here, but my brothers and sisters are not, then there's something I didn't do. Now, people can still get saved after this rapture, okay? That's uh, in, in the contention that says that there will be a rapture. And if your theology takes you down that road, then fine. The issue is, though, that there will be people coming to salvation fairly quickly right after the rapture because they'll be like, man, I thought I had it right. Or I had a lot of head knowledge, but I never let it change my heart. OK, and that's where a lot of people are today, even people in our churches. I mean, even Pastor David has said, you know, I'd be surprised if half the people sitting in our congregation today truly have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. They may call themselves Christians, but they haven't really surrendered to the Lord. They haven't given themselves totally to him, made him Lord of their lives. And so that's if you take it with the rapture, kind of like what you're talking about, Victor then th that the church as a whole would be gone. Those who truly are in Christ, have a relationship with him, would be taken. Now, the other take is that there is no rapture, that when the Bible talks about the parts of scripture where those that believe there is a rapture, it's actually talking about his second coming, then the issue becomes that all those Christians that are alive are being ushered into the tribulation, period, okay? And they then there would be no taking of the church but all these christians would then be part of coming into the tribulation so when the bible talks about the believers in the tribulation period he's talking not only about those who were ushered into it because they were still alive but also those unbelieving ones unbelieving christians so to speak would now see the signs coming true and many of them could potentially you know, then accept Jesus Christ and realize, uh-oh, I had it wrong all along. And so I need to get my act right with the Lord, right? And that's what Jesus told his disciples in Matthew 24. Hey, guys, 
look, all you have to do, these things are coming, but what you've got to do is you've got to be ready and you've got to be alert because these things are coming because that's what they, the disciples that asked him on that Mount, Mount Olivet discourse in Matthew 24 was, Lord, tell us, when will these things be? Tell us what will the signs be? And Jesus explained some of the signs that they would be expecting. So, so I mean, whichever path you take, there will be believers in the tribulation period. And those, you know, whether it, it are those that finally get right with the Lord because their brothers and sisters were taken in a rapture, or whether it's the people that have crossed over, and those then that have come to Christ, there are Christians in the tribulation period. It's not like it's total unbelief. So the Christians will have to go through tribulation in that period. Okay, it's not like they're going to be exempt. There are some of them that they will be exempt from, that God will protect those from. But there are other others of the different judgments that it will hit everybody. Like, like the wars. Hey, if you get killed in the war, Christians today can get killed in a war if you go serve as a, you know, as a sailor, as an army guy, or, you know, uh, uh, I mean, it can happen. Well, that's how it will be in the end times too. But I'll tell you, the issue is absent from the body present with the Lord is still in play, even in the tribulation, if you have made Jesus Christ Lord of your life. So, I mean, even though it will be terrible, God's plan for his believers still hasn't changed. And if you're in him, if you die, you get to go be with him immediately. If you don't, you keep going. There potentially could be, you know, if, if it's, there could potentially be Christians that end up transferring into the millennium without dying. I mean, think about that. I mean, because at the end of it all, the millennium starts. That's when Jesus comes and he rules on earth, right? Okay. Yeah, go ahead there, Mark. Well I know you could, everyone, everyone could take their position. Yeah, you know, yeah. Because obviously, uh, you know, it's up to uh, people to decide where they are. I, I'm, I'm, I personally, I take the pre, because I, I don't think God's going to allow the, his church to go through all that. Uh, or I could say is whoever's left behind, uh, once you accept the mark of the beast, you're over. Yeah. It's, it's, done, it's done for you. That's so cool. that during that period of time, people want to be, I mean, children will be born and they will have the opportunity. Yes. But those that claim to be Christian, unless they be decapitated at that time, there's not going to be no way out for their salvation. That's right. Yeah, because once, once they, once, uh, it's going to be tough in that time. It's no way. You, you can't, you can't buy no sale without the mark of the beast. That's and it. Once you take it, you are done. It's like, once you die, there's no time for repentance. So that's the same concept. Yeah. Why don't you take you. a march? That's it. It's over. That's but it. I, I agree that during that time, yeah, children will be born and they'll have the opportunity to accept Christ. That's right. I'll tell you, it's going to be a terrible time. That's the bottom line. It's a yeah, terrible but, time. Uh, you know, that's why I personally, I take the pre. I don't think the Christian, the church, it's not going to go to a tribulation. They will go to some tribulation at the beginning, but not to the whole tribulation. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, in a sense, it's going to start for us soon. In a, in a way, we're starting now. Right. We are going to, you know, it's tense. I guess it's going to get worse. I, I don't know if you want to call it tribulation, but yeah, persecution, let's say. Yeah. And it's going, to get, it's going to increase more and more and more, yeah. you know, before Christ comes. But the whole tribulation, I, I, I personally, personally do not think the church is going to go through it. Yeah. And I, I know that there are a lot of Christians that would agree with you, Martin, because who would want to go through anything like that? You know, it's like, Lord, just take it now. <laughs> It's, it's kind of yeah. like right at the end of Revelation, right. John says, oh, just come, Lord Jesus, come. You know, it's like, just get us out of here now, you know. I, mean, I don't have the verses now, but, you know, there are some verses that said that Christ will keep you from basically, it doesn't say it's specific to tribulation from yeah. the, the, the end time in a sense. I can't, I can't, I don't have the. the I, know I know Peter, in Peter, if it wasn't for God coming back, all of us would have been lost. And um, what's that, second or first Peter? Yeah, well, and First Thessalonians and Second Thessalonians talk about that, too, where Paul talks about what's happening. So, I mean, much of the church being taken before it come from those scriptures. Yeah. So Lord have mercy. Yeah. So, I mean, hey, the way I see it is this, you know, regardless of your position, take whichever one you want, because biblically, in a sense, you can support either position, but be 
the thing that we need to be sure of is that we are truly in Christ Jesus and that we have a relationship with him. And then whatever comes, comes and we're ready and we'll keep our eyes on him no matter what. If he takes the church, hallelujah, praise God, you know. If he doesn't, hallelujah, praise God. So the bottom line is, you know, we just need to keep our eyes on the Lord and be ready for what comes. And that's what Jesus told his disciples in Matthew 24. Just be ready. And so that's what our focus needs to be in the Lord, is just for us to be ready in him. Doing what he's called us to do so that when he takes us, we can say, he can say to us, well done, good and faithful servant, right? Yeah, go ahead there, Gail. Um, I was just going to say, I don't know how many times he says in the Bible, I will never leave you. Amen. Yeah, he says it in Deuteronomy. He says it in Hebrews, right? I will never leave you or forsake you. Yeah, he's with us. Okay, but you remember, <laughs> it is true he says that. But it also doesn't say that he's going to save us for, for all times of uh Adversary is going to come our lives. He oh, said yeah. he's going to be with us. He says he's going to keep us from us from going to all the situations coming to our lives. Yeah. No, I don't think that Gail's saying that we're not going to, you know, he's going to keep us away from any of that. I think she's just saying that no matter what you go through, he will never leave us or forsake us. Because even Jesus said, hey, you know, uh, they persecuted me. Guess what? They're going to persecute you. But if they reject me, guess what? They're going to reject you. If they hate me, guess what? They're going to hate you too. So, I mean, yeah. Jesus kind of prepared the way saying, you need to be ready because these things are coming and we will be going through these things. If you follow me and do what I say, Satan's not going to like it. The world's going to hate people like you if you're trying to overcome Satan's authority, you know? And in essence, that's what we're called to be like him. And in him, we can trust in him. Yeah, go ahead, Martin. But, but Ted, as you know, the, you know, I'll say the pastors, they're not preparing the, the flock today in the, with that message. No. It, no. It's, it's basically, it's, it's, a, it's a Kool-Aid message to say, okay, uh, everything is going to be fine with you. Yeah. Listen, you know, they, I mean, how many times you hear from the, from the pulpit? Oh, listen, you are going to go to difficult time, but God has promised going to be with us. It doesn't say you're not going to go through, you're not going to get sick, you're not going to have problems because... It is there in the Bible, but that's not what's being preached today. That's right. That's right. Yeah. I mean, it didn't Jesus say, hey, in the, in the world, you will have troubles, be, but be of good cheer for I have overcome the world and we are in him. But in other words, we are going to have troubles. Jesus made that clear. He didn't say, hey, everything's going to be peachy, creamy, you know, for you all along. But there are many messages out there today that make it sound that way. Like, hey, you're, you're all good people. At some level, we're all going to heaven, man. It's just which path you take. You know, it's, you know, and that's the falsest message that can be put out there. Because, I mean, there is no path except through Jesus Christ. There is no other path, you know. And by the Holy Spirit, he's the one that guides us. And I'll tell you, that's reality. And the reality is, as we follow Christ, we're going to have to do what he calls us to do. And in some cases, that may mean we're going to have to be persecuted for what we believe and for wh what, how we trust the Lord and the message that we proclaim about him. But we just need to be strong knowing that he is with us. And that's I think that's where Gail is saying, hey, you know, he'll never leave us or forsake us. So when we go through those things, we know the Lord is with us. But, you know, hey. So we don't have to worry about that because guess what? Who wants to hang around this world for more than 70, 80, 90 years? You know, <laughs> you know, going through the garbage that we go through when we can be up there with the Lord for all eternity in, in a perfect place with no sin, no, no desires of the flesh in the sense that we have here. But yet, you know, in, in a perfect place with the Lord, you know, to live out. I mean, who would want to stay here when you have that available to you? It's like, right, what are you going to do? You're going to threaten me with heaven? It's like, what? <laughs> it's like, send me there now, buddy. Yeah. <laughs> but he can. He got work for you to do. That, But that's the issue. Exactly. You ain't going nowhere. <laughs> that's it. That's, well, and that's what Paul said, right? He said, I'd rather go be with Christ now. You know, yeah. hey, if it was up to me, I'd, just, I'd say, I, hey, take me. 
You know, because you said. know, it's glad it's not up to us because we'll abandon that ship real quick. <laughs> we'll abandon that ship. Oh, yeah. man, I can't. Yep. But I'll tell you what, I agree with Martin that in James chapter three, where it talks about that pastors and teachers will be judged more harshly. I'll tell oh. you, with a lot of these messages that are being put out, man, I would not want to be in their shoes where they're trying to sugarcoat stuff for people and keeping them from developing and becoming the children of God that God wants them to be. We need to be careful with that. That's why, again, that's why I keep saying, it's great to be here in a Bible study where we learn what the Bible is, even though it's hard to accept sometimes, it's God's word though. And we learn it the way he wants us to know it, not the way, you know, somebody that wants to just have a popularity contest, you know, uh, win out, so to speak in following Christ, yeah. Well, let's pray, and we'll get with uh, our number five one, okay? Okay, dear Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for an opportunity to come together and to study your word. I pray that you would open up our hearts and minds and help us to understand what it is that we're looking at. We know that there are many different ways that these, these prophecies get interpreted but Lord, I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would just open up our hearts and minds to understand it in a way that gives us the right way to see it and to accept what it is that you have. But more than anything is that our relationship would be so strong with you that whatever comes, we are ready for, whether we're going to be in it or whether we're going to be up there with you. The, the bottom line is that we would please you and all we do, and become more like Christ as we learn about him and his work. So open our hearts and minds as we study now, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, let's go ahead and jump back into Revelation chapter 6, and we're going to look at verse 9. Uh, that's where we'll pick up, because I kind of gave you a quick insight as to all the other uh, seals that we heard. But Notice here, um, now we're going to talk about believers, okay? So it's amazing that in the process of judgment, all of a sudden, the picture of believers comes out. But look at the, the heart desire of these believers as we read about it. So it says, when he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar, so there is an altar up in heaven, or at least that's how John perceived up in heaven that there is this altar. And under this altar are the souls of those who have been slain for the word of God and for the witness that they had borne. Okay, so all these are martyrs, okay? They stood strong in the Lord, and they've been killed for what they believe, what they professed about Jesus Christ, about the good news. So the martyrs obviously have a special position in heaven. They, they are separated, they're separate, and I mean, they actually are, as it says here, they're under the altar, or at least that's the best way John could capture the idea and explain. And the altar would be right there with God, okay? It'd be in that realm. It'd be part, of, like, kind of like of his temple. The altar is part of the temple, you know? So, so they are up there, and they've been killed for the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, here in America... We're not seeing a lot of this happen yet. But think about our brothers and sisters in Iran or in Indonesia or in other Arab countries that are very, you know, Muslim uh, oriented or China. Think about our brothers and sisters there that once they say, hey, I believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and he is the one and only true God, you know, period. No other gods up there. Think about what happened. They could easily be martyred for a statement like that, okay, in those in that world. Hindu uh, just passed, the, I'm sorry to cut you off, Tim, yeah, but go ahead. in India, they just passed a law. If anyone tried to convert to Christ Christianity, you know, it's like death. The Hindu president just signed off wow. on that stuff. Well, how crazy. Right in the middle of all this garbage that's going on over there, and they yeah. have to get wrapped up with that. Yeah, so it's going, it's going to be a lot of martyrs over there. Uh, I think it's, so. It's, it's, it's a perfect season for that right now. You know, and, and that's kind of a little bit, I don't know, uh, crazy, because guess what? 
they have over 300 million gods and, and they got a problem <laughs> with, with the true God. That's the, you should know something is up. You should know something, just one guy. Go you know, figure. What, yeah. what if we introduce another guy? Would they have a problem with him? Probably not. But Go it's the figure. one true God that the devil is saying, no, not him, not him, not him, not him. <laughs> yeah, any we, of those other 300 million help yourself, but not this one. Yeah. Uh, you, here come Bob. Here's a new one, Bob. You know, Bob's <laughs> yeah. okay, but not Jesus. That's it. I'll tell you, that it's a crazy world we live in. It's as simple as that. So these are people Bob? that... These are people that have died for the Lord Jesus Christ. And Gail, I'm event. sorry, Ted. Gail, one, Gail will speak. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Gail. I was asking Mark again. Was that India, India you said? India. Okay, thank you. Yeah, it's a crazy boy. I'll tell you. What, I don't know how you can fit 300 million gods into India, but hey, they've got them. So, <laughs> but, so when we look at that, we realize, hey, Sometimes we're going to end up in situations in our lives that we may have to give our life for the Lord. That could, there, it's a possibility. Are we ready for that? But I'll tell you, there's a, a blessing in that if we do give our lives for the Lord. And that's what we're seeing here. These are the ones that are up there in heaven and they're under the altar. But look what he says in verse 10. In other words, they have a voice before the Lord. Look what they did. They cried out with a loud voice. Oh, sovereign Lord, holy and true, how long before you will judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? In other words, hey, you know, vengeance isn't mine, Lord. You said it in the Bible. Vengeance isn't mine. Vengeance is yours. So when are you going to do this? So actually, it's a, it's a valid request. It's a valid question. When are you going to handle the fact, because, I mean, that's what this whole judgment is about, is about the evil on the earth, okay? And so they're basically just saying, when are you going to deal with this evil totally? Get it taken care of, right? And so they say in verse 11, then they were each given a white robe and told to rest a little longer. In other words, they're resting, in a sense, up there before the throne of God. But the white robe says they are pure and clean before the Father. They are representative of God before him, totally clean and pure, right? And so they rest a little longer until the number of their fellow servants and their brothers should be complete who were killed as they themselves have been. So in other words, God is saying, hey, through this tribulation period, there are still more that will be martyred for my name's sake. They have to be added to your numbers before I take the final action. In other words, all the way until the last believer in Christ is martyred, I'm, I'm holding off. Okay, I'm holding off until then. But then that's when it'll happen. And so that's what he's told them. He's given them the white robes. He's, he's basically put them in their presence as righteous and clean before him. And they are in his presence and enjoying his presence, okay? They're up there with God. It's not like, you know, they're bumming or anything, but they had a question. It was a valid question, and God answered their question. So that's coming, okay? But notice that that's the fifth seal, but you say, well, that one's not so bad. Actually, yes, it is. The reason it's bad isn't that God's not taking the action right then. His action is still coming. The vengeance part for them is still to come. And that's going to be significant. Okay. So, I mean, it's, it's going to have to deal with all of the satanic forces and that kind of thing. So it's going to be not just, you know, in this world where he deal with it, but he will also be dealing with it in the second heaven where Satan is at. And that's to come. That, so that's what God is looking for in that fifth seal. It's a thing that will be incredible, but it's yet to come. So it's not, it's not a gimme, so to speak, that says, oh, that fifth one is no big deal, right? It's still to come. But then look what happens in the, in the sixth seal. When he opened the sixth seal, I looked and behold, there was a great earthquake. Now, I mean, when we think of earthquakes today, we think, okay, what about those that are like a, a, a seven? 
on the Richter scale or maybe bumping into an eight that's under the ocean and causes a tsunami, right? That kills 100,000 people like the one in, in the Indian Ocean over there in the South China Sea. Well, when we look at things like that, you think, man, that was a bad one. Well, this one, I mean, it's going to make those look like they were, you know, that you were just on one of those uh, toys at the park and the children play on that you rock on and, it, you know, it shakes you up. No, it's, I mean, these earthquakes are going to be really, really bad. And he says, but look at this. This shows the power of God, because now it's not just something that is strictly on the earth. But it also, God is doing, uh, he's putting signs in the heavens as well, okay? Now, some of these guys that study earthquakes, you know, geologists and the ones, I forget what the name of it for the people that are the ones that study earthquakes. But one of the things that you notice is that sometimes the heavenly uh, bodies can affect uh, our like if they come too close to our planet, they can affect and cause seismic problems in our, you know, our world. If something with a stronger gravity force puts a pressure on our world. But the issue is this, but look what God does. It's not just the earthquake here on earth, but look what he does in the heavens. And the sun became black as sackcloth. The full moon became like blood. Okay. Now, I mean, that's a God thing, because, hey, if the sun is black, the, the moon is strictly a passive, a passive receiver, isn't it? I mean, the light that we see from the moon is not light. The light we see from the moon has nothing to do with light coming from the moon. It is strictly a reflector. It reflects the light of the sun. But look at what happens here. It, when God has the sun become black as sackcloth, there will be no light to be reflected of by the moon. But look what God does. God has the full moon become like blood. So that means God is causing the color of the moon to be visible to us. If there's no sunlight, there would be no moonlight. Okay. So, I mean, that's God. So there's this earthquake. And these are two signs that are clearly supernatural because science couldn't explain that. I mean, some might say, well, it was an eclipse. No, it isn't. Hey, I guarantee you an eclipse would not turn the sun black. Okay, not going to happen. So, but look what he also does in verse 13. And the stars of the sky fell to earth as the fig tree sheds winter fruit when shaken by a gale. Now, I mean, we in the news, every so often we hear of this asteroid that may be kind of this a close passerby, right? We say, okay, we just, as a matter of fact, I think I just heard of one just within the last couple few months that they said was near. And you, so when you ask them, well, what is near? They say, well, within about 200,000 miles of the earth or that's considered near. Um, but in this case, God focuses some of the, the heavenly bodies to actually fall on the earth. Call them what you will. I mean, here, uh, they're called stars, but we know that a star can't fall to earth because think about it. If the sun was the sun, which is our only star in this solar system, was to fall on earth, what would happen? No more earth. <laughs> no more earth. <laughs> Ted, so could this be um, demons that's because they uh, fallen? Well, I mean, those are questions that, you know, I mean, are hard to understand. You know, yeah. what is it that John saw? How, I mean, he identifies them as stars. Could it be uh, live beings? I, yeah. I don't think so. Okay. Um, that's just me. I don't think so. I don't think that stars actually encompass that, but it sure doesn't encompass real stars. No. Because, hey, a real star, even if it got, you know, it, even if our sun was to come half the distance between Earth. where it is and uh, where we are, our, our Earth would be burned up. Barbecue chicken. Yeah, we'd be barbecue. <laughs> we would be toast. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Barbecue. Yeah. So, so we know that stars is not literal. Okay. This is figurative. And it's kind of like what Mark is saying. Could it be demons? I, I don't have any indication that it is. I don't know. Um, 
But all I know is that maybe it, I think they are heavenly bodies. So it could be that some of the asteroids, you know, come because anything that comes through our atmosphere leaves a trail. You know, if you go, you know how they tell you, hey, go out on this night and you'll see the so-and-so asteroid thing. This is the, when it's at its high point and you see all these white streaks or yellow streaks in our atmosphere, they burn up, but they, imagine if John saw that, he'd probably say, those are stars. Look at, they've got light, they're coming through. So I personally think that somehow God is going to redirect some of the asteroid belt our way. Now, Jupiter is what protects us right now from the asteroid belt. Anything that, you know, comes fr from the asteroid belt, Jupiter's gravity pulls it. And that protects us over here on Earth. But think about if God removes that gravity from Jupiter, it's going to come in our way. And I think, I think that's what he's talking about. I think that we will actually have, you know, these these uh, asteroids, maybe smaller ones or whatever, but they will do a lot of damage, you know, coming to Earth along with this earthquake. It's going to be bad. OK, because look what he says. Um, uh, look what he says about what happens with the island. The sky, verse 14, the sky vanished like a scroll that is being rolled up. It's almost like as if when these uh, things started coming through, like as if it, it almost pull, ripped the fabric of our, you know, the, the different layers of our um, environment above us that protects, you know, like the Van Allen radiation belt, you know, and things like that. It's almost like those are ripped in the process. Now, obviously God doesn't remove them because if he did, all, all of us would die. I mean, we depend on, the Van Allen radiation belt, and the different layers of our atmosphere. If those were to be removed, we would die. If we were to be exposed to space, then the whole earth would be exposed to space. Nobody can live in that. So obviously, the way John is seeing it, he just sees that something has happened as these things come, and it looks like as if the heavens are being rolled back as a scroll. Okay, that's the way he interprets it. But look what happens uh, in the process of this earthquake and with this falling of stars. Look what he says. Every mountain and every island was removed from its place. To me, that's significant tectonic activity. You know, I mean, this is, I, that's why I'm saying this earthquake is no small thing. For it to totally reorient things on the earth, I mean, it's shifting the whole tectonic issue of the earth as, and, it, and, and to the way it looked to John is that the mountains were being moved and the islands were gone or moved out of their place. I mean, it was so significant in what John was seeing was happening on the earth. So that's a tremendous earthquake. That, I mean, that's gonna have to be like a 15 on the Richter scale. You know what I'm talking about? <laughs> that, I mean, it is huge, okay? And think about it. John has no way of even interpreting something of that magnitude. So he's explaining it as best he can, you know, with his understanding. And so he's bringing that about. And so we see that, man, this is going to be a terrible, a terrible, a very terrible seal that's going to happen. I mean, and it doesn't just affect the earth, but it's also affecting the heavens as well. I mean, this is big, okay? So in verse 15, then the kings of the earth and the great ones and the generals and the rich and the powerful and everyone, I mean, we're talking the whole world is, uh, you know, they're, they're like, oh man, this is bad. Slave and free, look, everybody, they went into caves. They hid themselves in caves and among the rocks of the mountains, like as if, yeah, hey, this is where we can be safe, right? I don't think so. They're not going to be safe. But look what they were doing. Calling to the mountains and rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who is seated on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. That's what it all comes down to. They are finally getting the picture that this is God's judgment. The wrath of the Lamb is real. And they just want to die. Okay. I mean, it's so bad. 
that they just want to die. They don't want anything to do with it. They're just like God. Well, not God. They're just because the, most of these aren't going to be believers. OK, they're going to be like, hey, man, I just want to get out of this, you know. And the issue is this is judgment. So they're not getting out of it. OK, it's it's there. They got to deal with. It. So let me see. Somebody's chatting me up here. Oh, uh, Victor said, is it a geologist? Uh, I know it's a branch of geology that deals with uh, with earthquakes, but I just don't remember. They have a name for them, you know, that specific branch that really specifically looks at tectonic movements. It, I mean, all geologists look at that at some level, but I know that they have a special name for the ones that have a, that specialty in looking at earthquakes. So. But yeah, let's just say geologist for now, because I mean, it's in that it's in that scientific realm. So so thank you, Victor, for looking that up. And uh, so, I mean, when we're looking at this, the people are realizing that a God is in control. Now, do you think these people are instead are calling to God to save them through Jesus Christ, the, the lamb? They're instead, they just rather die just let me die. Come on. You know, and look what they're saying. They're, they're asking the rocks and the mountains calling them to fall on them. That's what they want. They don't want to accept that Jesus Christ is Lord and that God is all powerful and he deserves their worship. They instead would rather die instead of worship God. And how many people today are that way? Think about it. I mean, it's not our call to identify, oh, that person would not accept Christ. That person would not. Accept. That's not our call. Our call is to tell everybody about Jesus Christ, right? They have that free will I talked about earlier. They can reject, but hey, God already knows who are his. But we need to tell the message so that those people will indeed come into Christ's saving grace. He uses us. That's what we're here for. We're his vessels for his use. So, that's where we're coming from on that sixth seal. It's a bad one. It's a bad time, okay? In heaven and on earth, in both areas, it is terrible, even to the point where people want to die. Just, hey, I'm done with this. I'm, <laughs> I'm ready to go now, okay? So now what happens between the sixth and the seventh is we kind of get this interim picture, okay? God identify some issues. Israel comes into the picture again, okay? So let's look at what he says in this part of the picture. Oh, whoops. I think I got to the end of chapter six. I'm in chapter seven. Uh, by the way, I'll put out the notes for chapter seven next week. So I apologize. I, I didn't think I'd get this far. Uh, but let me just jump in real quick here and, and say this part, because I think it's important that we understand and see how God's plan is always in place. It's not just about judgment, but he's got other plans to be able to fulfill what he's going to carry out before the end of this tribulation period. And this is why I was saying, keep your eyes on Israel. Israel is always a key player in God's plans. You know, even though they've, they're rejecting him today, for the most part, I mean, I'm talking about Jesus Christ, you know, they... They think they're worshiping God, but by rejecting Jesus Christ, in a sense, they're rejecting God as a whole because Jesus is God just as much as the Father is God or the Holy Spirit is God, you know? So they need to be careful, and but they will come back. So look what he says Af in verse one of chapter seven. After this, I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth. Let's just call it since the, you know, the earth is round, Let's just say north, south, east, and west, okay? God has one at the top, one at the bottom, and one on either side, okay? So, but far enough out to where they can, you know, do what they got to do to cover the whole earth. And so he sees these four angels up there, and they're holding back the four winds of the earth that no wind might blow on the earth or any tree. Okay, so... I mean, remember, winds come from pressure gradients, right? I mean, that's how wind is generated. There are pressure gradients in the atmosphere 
And it's these pressure gradients that cause wind and weather. And so, well, what, the, what these angels are doing is they're stopping all of these weather patterns, these pressure gradients. They're in, in, under God's control. Remember, Jesus controls everything and holds everything together, like he says in Colossians 1.16. Well, God is allowing the angels to stop this part of his creation. He's, they're stopping it, so there is no pressure gradient. There will be no wind without pressure gradient, okay? So he's stopping this, and he says, so they have no wind that blows on the earth or against any tree. Now, some would say, well, wait a minute. Can you still breathe? Yeah, wind doesn't have anything to do with, you know, the air. It just says there, there is no wind of any kind throughout the whole earth. The whole earth has no wind whatsoever. And then he says, then I saw another angel ascending from the rising of the sun. In other words, the sun rises from the east, okay, and sets in the west. So that's what he's saying. He says, I saw this angel coming up from the east, from the rising of the sun. That's the way it's defined with the seal of the living God. Okay. Now the seal means it's authoritative that it, you know how, you know how the Pharaohs or like Joseph, remember the Pharaoh gave him his ring and said, unless I'm sitting on the throne, you, no one is greater than you, not even I. Well, with that seal in his ring, he had the authority of the Pharaoh. Well, that's what, that's what we're talking about here. This angel with the seal of the living God, okay, he's, he's got that authority because he's got the seal of God. And so he called with a loud voice to the four angels who had been given power uh, to harm the earth and sea, saying, okay, now see, by holding back the wind, it, it damages the earth because, I mean, the earth works on this principle. I mean, it, wind was a central part of God's creation. Wind is necessary. It, it works within all of our creation, and it is essential to the health of our environment. Winds are necessary. Plus well, it must be hot. <laughs> oh, I, I'm telling you, it, it would be bad. Yes, you're right. You're right, Sherry, because I mean, that's what it does. It helps circulate. Yeah, go ahead, Victor. You're muted. I said, there goes the Texas windmills. <laughs> Yeah, none of the windmills will work, exactly. <laughs> if they were depending strictly on wind power for their energy, it's gone. So, <laughs> but look at what God is telling. He's saying, okay, you know, I've given you power, not just over the wind, but apparently over other things that would do damage, okay? So he says he to these angels who he had given power to harm earth and sea, saying, uh, Let's hold off, okay? Do not harm the earth or the sea or the trees. I, I'm holding off until this, until we have sealed the servants of our God on their foreheads. Okay, now you say, okay, who are the servants of God? Let's go back into Israel. Israel in the Jewish nation is still gonna be central to God's plan and purpose. And so in the process between the sixth seal and the seventh seal, he says, and I heard a number of the sealed, 144,000 sealed from every tribe of the sons of Israel. So Israel's going to be sealed by God's power and by his direction and guidance. Okay, sealed means they become his. They are, in essence, they are chosen to do his bidding. Okay, so look what he says. And what ends up happening is that he seals 12,000 from every tribe. So there's 12 tribes times 12,000 is 144,000, okay? Each one. So we see the tribe of Judah, tribe of Reuben, tribe of Gad, tribe of Asher, tribe of Naphtali, tribe of Manasseh, tribe of Simeon, tribe of Levi, tribe of Issachar, the tribe of Zebulun, the tribe of Joseph, and the tribe of Benjamin were sealed. So there's 12,000 from each one is sealed. So we got a total of 144,000. Now be careful. This is where the Jehovah's Witness love to lock on, right? 
they think they were part of this, or they were this 144,000. Well, the problem is when they exceed 144,000, it's kind of hard to get new new recruits because it's like <laughs> you already you already got the ones that are going, you know. And so, uh, <laughs> so the problem is they've kind of softened their message. They've no. amended it. They've amended it. Ted, yeah, they've so. amended it. <laughs> But the Bible is clear here. They were that 144,000. Yeah, that's what the Jehovah's Witness thought. Yeah. What what made what makes them think that? Whoever, uh, I guess this dude Russell that started Jehovah's Witness or something. That's not me, by the way. Uh, must <laughs> you know? He must have been. That must have been his theology. Hmm. He he used that because I mean a lot of these denominations that are out there. Why do they end up making the denomination? A lot of times they do it based on the way they interpret the scriptures themselves. There's nothing to support it or substantiate what he's saying, but it's amazing how people will follow him or her, whatever the case may be. Yeah. So that's, I mean, I, I don't know, Gene. I don't know what made him think that he could use that as leverage to say, hey, this is what we're going to believe. But he did. And he's uh, technically they still do. Hmm. Yeah, crazy, huh? Yeah. Yeah. Because I mean, oh. yeah, it's 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 a tough thing. It's a tough thing. But people, people can be bamboozled. Uh -huh. And I'll tell you, a, a lot of people end up, you know, going and living that lie. They think they got hope, and there's no hope in that. Yeah. They don't see Jesus as the Son of God. That's that's the biggest fallacy right there. You know, so they just see him as a prophet. So they got to be careful. So that's what the Bible talks about in terms of 144,000. They are Jews. They are God's chosen people. And, you know, from the Old Testament, we've seen that. And they've got, God still has a plan and a purpose for them. Okay. So they're sealed. They've got a function in Christ. Okay. Or in the world to carry out God's plan in the world. Okay, so uh, so then look what he says in verse nine. After this, I looked and behold, a great multitude that no one could number from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages. Now look where these people are standing before the throne and before the land clothed with white robes with palm branches in their hands and crying out with a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the lamb. Okay, we know that there is salvation in no other name but the name of Jesus, right? And that's exactly what we're seeing here. Jesus is the only one. God has already ordained and given all authority in heaven and on earth to Jesus. That's a given. God's already done that. That's clear in Matthew 28, verse 16, in that area, right? That's where he talks about that all authority has been given to him. And notice what happens. And because of that statement, all the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures, and they fell on their faces before the throne and worshiped uh, God, saying, Amen. Notice what they say worship God. Because that is the son and the father are sitting there together, okay? And in other words, God in his triune nature is there because the spirit is in them, okay? The spirit is hit theirs, just like the spirit is in us, right? It's not like the spirit is out. It's not like they have a third throne for the spirit. The spirit is in the son just as much as he's in the father, as much as the son is in the father and the father is in the son because they're one, okay? And so that's why by saying that about Jesus, about the one, the lamb, they all fall down glorifying God. Notice that it doesn't say the lamb, but God saying, amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God, the triune nature of he is forever and ever. Amen. In Jesus Christ basically is what they're looking at, but it's God in his triune nature right there. And so one of the elders addressed me saying, now this is, I thought this was kind of interesting that one of the elders talks to him. He says, well, then one of the elders addressed me saying, who are these 
clothed in white robes, and from where have they come? See, because the normal answer would be, weren't that, weren't those the martyred ones that were put in white robes? You know, no, we've got an actual different picture here. And look what <laughs> look what John's answer. I said to him, basically saying, I don't have a clue, dude. Why don't you know? So why don't you tell me? Here's what he says. I said to him, this is John. Sir, you know, in other words, I haven't got a clue, but you know, so I'm just going to put it back on your lap so that you can answer the question, right? <laughs> and, and so the guy, you know, accepts it and says, and he said to me, these are the ones coming out of the great tribulation. So now we see, we see the martyred saints that got white robes, but now here are those that are coming out of the great tribulation. This is, are those that have died through these uh, seal judgments, the trumpet judgments, and the bull judgments, okay? In other words, they'll have died during that great tribulation period, which is that last three and a half years. So any of the Christians, the believers that are there that die in that time are the ones that John is seeing here that is being, uh, that are before the throne, this great multitude. Notice that he didn't say it's a small amount. He says it was a great multitude, okay? So look what he says here. Um, uh, and here in verse 9, a great multitude that no one could number from every nation, from all tribes, and from peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands and crying out with a loud voice. Salvation belongs to God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Now, the issue here that we need to understand, we're not looking at onesie twosies that are going to be saved or are saved in that tribulation period that are going through the great tribulation. We're talking about a mighty amount of number of people from all over the world, from every tribe and language and people and nation all over the world that have died in the tribulation for Christ. Okay. These are the ones that the 144 went around and preached to? Uh, I mean, uh, that's very possible. Uh, but all I know is that these are saved. These, so we know that in the tribulation period, there are going to be a lot of people that know Christ and have come to him. Whether they've done it before or after, I don't know. I just know that there's going to be a lot of them that died during this period, you know, whether through martyrship or just because of the wrath that they just, you know, succumb to. Because look at, I mean, look at the ones we've looked at so far, the global war, the quarter of the earth that dies, you know, population, you know that that's not just going to be unbelievers, you know, so, I mean, that's who makes up these numbers that John is looking at here. They are a lot of people. Now, he doesn't give us a number like, uh, oh, it's 2 billion or 4 billion. He just says it's a number that, a, a, an amount that we can't number. I can't number according to his way of counting, that kind of thing. So it's a lot of people that have died during this tribulation, the great tribulation period. Mm -hmm. And they will also have on their robes, okay, of white uh, before the line. Because, and that's, that's exactly what this elder is telling them, that they are coming through the great tribulation, that last three and a half years when all these judgments are being carried out. And look what it says. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the lamb so it's because of jesus christ and his shed blood that we are white because you remember in psalm i don't know if you remember but in if you look at psalm uh 51 um remember oh hang on hang on hang on i'll get there in a second when i learn to type uh 51 uh look what he says here uh ch -ch -ch -ch. Oh, here, look at verse seven. Purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean, right? Wash me. This is in, think of this as Christ. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. This is David appealing to God for his sin. And he's saying, you know, that was the Bathsheba sin. He's saying, hey, I look to you, God. In this case, it's kind of him looking forward to Christ. And he's saying, hey, it, you purge me with hyssop. You know, it's a plant that they use to wash things down with. And he says, I know with the plant, you doing it 
I will be clean. But as you wash me in you, in your blood, I shall be whiter than snow. And that kind of fits in as David, you know, uh, talks about it the same way he's talking about here that they have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the lamb. It kind of fits with that, almost like King David knew that. You know, he sensed that that was the way that it would be clean. And we see it actually happening in the blood of the lamb here. So, so I mean, that is what we're looking at. I, I don't think I was going to go any further than that. But Sarah Grant said Well, hang on, let me see. Yeah, I think that's about as far as we'll go tonight. But, I mean, when you look at the these people that are going through this tribulation period, this is a terrible time and i mean there are going to be a lot of believers that die but man the beauty of it is that they don't die for nothing look they get to go be in heaven before the throne of god and they get to worship him right there as they receive his blessings i mean we see that in these verses that we just looked at you know here between verses 9 and verse uh, uh hang on 13 or 14 9 and 14, we see that, man, I mean, they, they are in a great place. They're, they're not in hell. We'll, we'll get that later. But, man, they're not being tortured or anything. They're before God, and they are worshiping and praising him. And they're saying, man, this is awesome. And that's where we'll be. I mean, I mean I'm not talking about us in, necessarily in the tribulation unless God brings it on and we have to go through it. But I mean, we will be up there with him, with that great crowd of witnesses, you know, that are up there, and we'll get to celebrate with them, and I think that's a beautiful picture of what we still have to come, so don't look at these trials and tribulations and this judgment as negative for the Christian. Look at them as God's amazing grace and carrying out what is right and righteous and deserving in his just nature and That's he does see it, in it ted yeah i and, see god grace in it amen amen you it's know just, it's yeah go ahead i would just say it just swells up my heart as you're reading this i'm like he still find a way to get us out of this he still find a way to take care of us amen all of this and i'm reading when you're reading it i see the, the i do the trouble that we're going to go through but he still find a way to take care of his children amen oh and give us a way out. He's like, he's giving us the answers Amen. to the test. You know, Amen. you know, what a God. Amen. And I'll tell you, and even the people that reject him, they have the free will to do that. You know, he still loves them, even to the point to where we get to the great white throne and he has to throw them into hell. He still loves them even up to that, even in that point where he's throwing them into hell. But they purposely say i don't want anything to do with you lord even even as they're going into hell they'll say the same thing uh, yeah I, I i ain't got nothing with you i don't want anything with you. and it's sad because i mean we see the wonder and the glory for the believer that is available to them in spite of all this judgment and this serious wrath that's going on we can still see god's loving mighty hand involved in it all So any final questions, comments up through verse 14 there? And what I'll do mm -hmm. is get, get the notes out next week for uh, chapters uh, six, uh, seven, seven, hang on, seven and eight. Okay, seven and eight, because I'll, I'll go over what we just talked about a little bit in the intro so that we will pick up and go into, into eight. So when... You when it says the stars from the sky fell to the earth. Okay, um, almost everybody I think would read that and think of the literal stars at nighttime, you know, right, that right. are in the sky. Yeah. But you're saying that that's not necessarily what they're saying when they say, say that. That's right? right, that's right. Yeah, because one of the things that's difficult about Revelation is that you gotta remember, how does John explain something that he's never had been exposed to he mm -hmm. just sees 
something happening. And in his description, the best way he can say it, because anything that comes through our atmosphere leaves a trail. Okay, like if you get a small asteroid come through, it's going to leave a, a, a yellow trail or a colored trail coming through our atmosphere, either as it burns up or as it enters our atmosphere, because the friction causes. It. So that could look like a star to John. Okay, but the thing is, the reason it can't be a star, guess what? Our sun is only a medium sized star. Okay. So think about it. What if one of the, you know, a star that's, you know, a million times bigger than ours was to come our way? You know, I mean, it wouldn't even have to, it wouldn't even have to come to Pluto and we would be scorched. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> so, I mean, stars. And the nine stars are small, though. Well, that's how they appear. See, and to John, that's how it would appear to him is that the way it looked like those coming into our Earth were small. So yeah, so the real, probably the correct interpretation of it is, is that they were probably more like asteroids. Um, I mean, because I mean, I know I every year you hear of this Pleiades asteroid or something, they say, hey, if you come out at this time of the night, that's at the high and when you'll see the, the asteroids, you know, bouncing off of our atmosphere and they leave streaks and stuff like that it, it's beautiful actually but they're usually smaller and you know they don't penetrate our atmosphere they bounce off but they leave a yellow sparkly trail as they hit and so so i mean i think that that's what john was seeing but we, it will be more pronounced for us because i mean these will be asteroids that actually do come through our atmosphere and they will land on earth and they will be devastated when they hit, yeah. I mean, if you look at our moon, you know how you see all the craters on it? See, the moon has no atmosphere to protect it against anything that's flying through the heavens, you know? So, I mean, those, those small, all those craters are because of things that have hit the actual moon and, and landed there and pitted it up. Well, think about that on earth during the time that we read about that these stars would fall to earth because that's what it'll do it'll leave these big pits you know wherever these asteroids hit they'll damage cities they'll damage you know i mean if they hit where a city is or in a livable area it's gonna do a lot 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 of damage yeah i was just gonna say um you know they had talked about in the past about an asteroid destroying the earth yeah, well, I mean, there are movies about that, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, Bruce Willis. Bruce Willis will take his crew out there and he'll put a bomb on it and blow it up. Oh, that's it. Yeah, yeah. Oh, Bruce, he is such a man. <laughs> yeah, that was, a, that was a good movie, by the way. But, uh, yeah, go ahead, Victor. A star that big hits us, could then knock us out of orbit? Oh, well, not, I mean... Not any of the asteroids. I mean, yeah, there are big asteroids, but I mean, it'd have to be a big one uh, to do that kind of damage. I don't know if God will allow that because I mean, still the millennium has to come and Jesus rules and we don't see that the earth is outside its orbit at that point. Something, you know, that would be unusual. So mm -hmm. I... I mean, yeah, if a big enough body hit us, that, that could definitely do it. But I think God will, it's still going to be bad, but I don't think God will let it be that bad. Oh, and by the way, seismologist is, yeah, the ones that work with the, uh, the tectonic issues. Yeah, you're right. The, the geologists in the seismology area. Yeah. So thank you for that, Victor. So, I mean, I'll tell you what, there's a lot coming. There's a lot coming. And I'll tell you, it's going to do a lot of damage on this earth. A lot of damage on this earth. Not to mention in body count. Uh, it's going to tear up the world. We already saw that already. Look at the mountains and the islands shifting because of that earthquake. Yeah, that is significant. Okay. I, I think that's when California is going to fall off into the ocean, by the way. Yep. yep. <laughs> oh. <laughs> uh, well, I don't. I don't think we have. Uh, I don't think we have a tectonic. Well, oh. not that. I think that that's going to matter. 
but I was thinking there's no tectonic uh, 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 plate that happens like above Florida. If it did, I'd say, yeah, Florida would be swimming too. <laughs> Can we scroll back and um, see the description of those five beasts again? Because whatever they were, they were worshiping with. The four? Oh, it's four? Yeah, four living creatures here in chapter six. Yeah. Yeah, look, he says, now I watched and the lamb opened one of the seven seals and I heard one of the four living creatures say with a voice of thunder, Okay, but you want to see the description of it, not yeah. just what it said. Okay, All hang on. Eyes. Yeah, yeah. Where did they take a stroll? Where they land? Uh, tip it up. Sorry. Uh, and between the throne and the four living creatures. Okay, we still. And I saw on the right hand seat on the scroll. I saw a mighty scroll and break and worthy behold the line of the tribe of Judah, Judah, David. Scroll on the lamb. One of the living creatures. Uh, and the four living creatures eve to them with six wings. See, that sounds like uh, six wings are the cherubim. Each of them with six wings are full of eyes all around and within, and day and night they never cease to say, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. This is chapter four, verse eight. Okay, so they were already worshiping whatever yep. they were. Yep. And there was 24 elders. Yeah. Oh, uh, here's, here's verse six. It says, and before the throne, there was, as it were, a sea of glass like crystal. And around the throne, on each side of the throne, are four living creatures full of eyes in front and behind. The first living creature like a lion. The second living creature like an ox. The third living creature like the face of a man. And the fourth living creature like an eagle in flight. And the four living creatures, each with six wings, are full of eyes all around. So, yeah. That's chapter four, verse six and seven and eight. Yeah, it doesn't say that one. It's not like the face of a man. It says it, it is a face. Yeah. Of uh huh. So I mean, I mean, I'll tell you, John must have been. <laughs> he must have been <laughs> utterly impressed with you know what he was exposed to there because I mean he's like, man, how do I explain this stuff? <laughs> Ah, I'll tell you, heaven's going to be a great place. I think we are going to be so amazed when we get there. It's going to be like, wow, we didn't even know the, as the saying goes, the half of it, you know, but oh, yeah. I think we'll be learning for all eternity of God's wonder. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Any other questions, comments? Is there like G said? Progress is our most important product. <laughs> Maybe so. All right, Doug. I think Doug, Doug missed it. <laughs> Let's see here. Okay, so we've got the seven seals. We got those, and we'll pick up in verse sixteen or fifteen. Uh, chapter 7 verse 15 next week but i'll explain it to make it all come back together again any other final questions comments <coughs> excuse me okay let me stop sharing i'll tell you it's 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 an amazing time that that will be you know and uh <laughs> I'll be honest with you. I just pray we are all with the Lord <laughs> and we can watch it from heaven. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> oh, my goodness. But the issue is we just need to be ready. We just need to be ready. That way, no matter what comes, hey, it's all you, Lord. Yeah. Is that what they were saying about that song, That's Domino? Oh, how did that song go? I'm ready. Oh, there yes, you go. Yes, indeed, I'm ready. There you go. For you and me, I'm ready. Oh, so you, he was a Christian. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> uh, okay. Um, let me see here. Okay, so we got that. And I've got Sherry's Praise the Lord. And I've also got her. Uh, so... And, and then also we're going to be praying for you, too, for what the rest of the stuff you're dealing with. OK, Sherry. Um, and then we're, we're going to continue to play for your wife's recovery, Mark. Amen. Amen. Uh, 
Yeah, go ahead, Gail, Doug, Gail, any, anything. Uh, Brandon, uh, we just want to pray that they come up with a answer. answer to the, this thing's been going on so long. He's had test after test after test, and we haven't heard a thing yet. No. Oh, this, oh, you, you mean, us? Uh, what's his name? Brandon. Brandon. Man, I was thinking, I don't know yeah. what. So, I mean, they're still jerking him around, basically. Yeah. Yep, they are. Okay. I got gotcha. you. You got it. You got it. Yeah, well, yeah, because we've been praying for him. It's like, yeah, it's like, well, did they do anything this time or not? It's, yeah. Back in February or sometime. Yeah, so yeah. In like five months. And I'm Crazy. like, uh, but uh, thank you. Thank you very much. We Absolutely. Appreciate Anybody else? I just pray for Alyssa because she hasn't been feeling good. She's scheduled to work tomorrow. Oh, that's right. You said she was feeling uh, like dizzy, right? Dizzy and stomach problems. And because oh, okay. you know, she had a stomach bug. Ah, but, gotcha. Um, but yeah, I think the other things from her pots, her blood pressure, because that can cause dizziness. Okay. So just to get it under control before tomorrow for work. Amen. Amen. And then my my cousin Lisa that had a double mastectomy, she's getting ready to start chemo. So oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's really tough for her, and she just got her hair cut short. You know. Um, yeah. In case she's always, she's, she's yeah. always had long hair. You know, all her life, and then she cut it short because she said she wanted to have some control over her body before the chemo takes it away. Oh, bless you know? her heart. Yeah, I, I can yeah. understand that. I always said I'd shave my head bald before I started with that. Yeah. Yeah, I, I was kind of surprised she didn't cut it shorter because I would have, you know, I mean, it's it's cute and it's short, but it's about, you know, my length or maybe a little bit longer than that. And I'm like, you should have just like shaved the sides or something, you know, because you're still going to have clumps coming out, you know? Uh, so. Yeah, that's, that's a sad thing. Yeah. yeah, it's rough, isn't it, Gail? Yep, yeah. I'm it off. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You're almost there. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, anyway. <laughs> Any other prayer items, prayer requests tonight? Ted, play, please play for Robert, Liz's dad, to come to Jesus. Oh, yeah. You got it. You got it, brother. Anybody else? Okay, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your opportunity that you've given us to study your word and especially to study your plan and purpose that you, you know, it's not over. And you've got these marvelous things still to pass, still to come, I should say. Um, and we look to you, Lord, and we thank you that we are in you. And that no matter what, no one can take that from us. We, we, Lord, we look to you and we just want to let you know that we love you. We adore you. We praise you. And we give you all the honor and the glory. Man, I'll tell you, you know, one of the things that I just see in Revelation is your mercy and your grace for those that you love. And that, you know, even though you love those who have not come to you, judgment will come and that judgment is sure and without a doubt and it will be significant so lord i just look to you and ask that you just give us insight but more than anything is that it would just help build our faith and our trust in you as we see your plans that you still have you know yet to carry out but yet you've given us some insight into these things uh, because we're your children and you give it, you know, although they aren't explicit and exhaustive, I mean, we still get a picture that that judgment will come and it will be what you have determined that is just and right to be able to address the issues of this fallen world and the fact of what's been going on for these so many millennia 
uh, you know, just living in this fallen world and with this fallen nature. But Lord, nothing is impossible for you. And your, your love is just extravagant. So Lord, help us as we continue to study your word to see your plan and purpose and know that you're there and functional in it all to your honor and glory because that's what it all comes down to and i mean i think the beauty of it is is that then we are at the footstool of your final work through the millennium and then we get to go live with you forever and ever amen on the new heaven and the new earth wow i'll tell you if Man, that would, that's just going to be amazing. And of course, for those who, who die before this, you know, we get to go live with you even now, even soon. And it's going to be amazing as we see the end of this earth, this world, and we finally get to see your recreation of the world the way it was intended to be. And to live with you forever in your wonder and in your grace. And man, I'm I can't even begin to imagine all the things that you have available for us and yet to come because you even said it in scripture that we can't even begin to imagine the wonders and the glory that you have available for those who love you. So, I mean, boy, I just know that it's going to be wonderful being with you forever and ever in spite of these things that still yet have to happen that are, are horrendous, but just. And we look to you and we trust you in and through it all. Now, Lord, I want to bring up some prayer requests to you and just thank you that you've already got no one, but and that you've got them under control, but we're just going to articulate them anyway. I want to praise you, Lord, for what you've done for Sherry and that her taste and smell has been, you know, is almost fully recovered. And at least that will give her, you know, a sense of of pleasure in what you provide for her, Lord, in her eating and whatnot. So, Lord, I just pray that you just bless her and, and restore her fully in terms of the taste and smell. And, Lord, but I do pray for her other issues that she's dealing with. You know, the matter with her, you know, getting the pain shot in her back and the problem that there is right now because of the blood thinner she's taking. Lord, I pray that they are able to resolve that matter so that she can get that shot before she goes on her trip up to see her son mm -hmm. and with Alyssa so that, you know, she can, you know, do that trip, you know, with the, without the pain that she's been dealing with, you know, in terms of what she, the, her pain is being generated from and that may be resolved through this shot, Lord. So please open up that opportunity there. Also pray for her other maladies that she's dealing with, Lord, that you would put your healing hand on her and remove the, those, those maladies, Lord. We look to you and we trust you in and through it all. And we look to your healing power, Lord God, because you are Jehovah Rapha, God, our healer. You created us in our, in our mother's wombs and you made us specially. So you know us best. You know exactly what needs to be resolved and healed. So we look to you for that healing, Lord God, I pray. And we thank you even now for what you have done and what you will do. I also want to pray for Alyssa, Lord. I know she's not feeling real well, maybe blood pressure issue, whatever, that she's, you know, causing her maybe to feel a bit dizzy and whatnot. But Lord, I pray that you would just put your healing hand on her so that she will feel well to go to work tomorrow and that you would just be with her and give her peace as she, you know, it uh, carries out, I mean, the fact that she's working now. And that's great. That's awesome. You know, that she's got that job and she's able to go do it. So give her health to be able to do it, Lord. I also want to pray for Mark's wife, Lord, that you would continue to keep your hand on her, that she would just experience full recovery. And that, you know, I mean, she would be up and about soon. Lord, we just ask for your healing hand on her and full recovery. And we trust you in and through it all, Lord. And we thank you that the surgery went well. And we praise you for your wonderful love in that matter. Now, Lord, also pray for Brandon. Lord, you know what we've been praying for. We, we ask you, Lord, to open up opportunities so that he can finally get a diagnosis for the condition that he has. And that it wouldn't keep getting postponed or pushed off or held back or but, or people questioning whether they've done the right tests or not. But Lord, give wisdom 
to those who were looking at him that they would finally know what to be able to look for and open up their minds so that they can see what it is that Brandon needs so that they can address the matter in, in short order. So I pray for your, your, your power to be there. And also just put your healing hand on his foot where he's having, you know, where his uh, foot is pronated that way. Just Lord, we look to you. I mean, with you, we don't have to wait for all these times and things to get lined up or for people try to come to consensus. But Lord, we look to you. So put your healing hand on Brandon. And if you're going to use the, you know, medical system that they would finally come to grips and, and address the matter with him and get that matter fixed up, Lord. We look to you and we trust you in and through that. Lord, I pray for Lisa, you know, Sherry's cousin, as, as you know, she's had the double mastectomy, but the treatment requires the chemo. And she's going to go on chemo now, Lord. I pray that you would be with her and give her peace through that chemo. It's sad that we have to have things that sometimes, you know, the cure sometimes can be worse than the disease, it seems like. But Lord, we look to you for your healing hand on her and give Lisa peace as she deals with this matter, Lord. But more than anything, clear up this cancer out of her, Lord. I mean, she's gone through these steps to try to get over it. But Lord, we need your healing hand there to fully you know, bring her, bring that cancer into remission or just remove altogether, Lord. We look to you, but more than anything, Lord, give her strength and peace. Lord, I also pray for Robert, Liz's dad, you know, as Aaron has mentioned. Lord, we prayed last week and we pray this week again, Lord, that you would bring him to salvation, that you would open up his eyes and let him know that, man, this world is, has nothing to offer. And what's left after this world has nothing to offer if it's not in Jesus. So, Lord, I pray that you would work on his heart and let him, you know, Father, I pray that you would draw him to, that you would, you know, just put your hand on him and let your Holy Spirit work in his heart, that you, Lord God, would bring him into your saving grace. Lord, just that he would be open to the gospel and to receiving you, Lord Jesus, I pray. Now, Lord, as we go, I pray that you go with us. I pray that any prayer requests that haven't been mentioned, that you would take them on. You say you know our thoughts and our needs and every word, even before it's on our tongue. So, Lord, we put these all before the throne. We come boldly before your throne of grace, seeking your wonder, your mercy, and your answer to prayers, whatever they may be so that you may be honored and glorified, Lord God, in all that you accomplish. We thank you and we praise you, and we ask that you go with each and every one of us and be with us and let us grow in your wonder and in becoming more like Christ, I pray every day. In Jesus' precious name, amen. 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 Thank you so much, Ted. Amen. Hey, my pleasure, Aaron. Hey, did, did that text that I sent you answer your questions about the, like the cooperative program and those kind of things that deal with the convention? Uh, you, get, you mean your email? Yeah. Oh, the email. I mean, yeah. 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 Okay. Uh, okay. Yeah. I'm curious to see what money the church is giving to. Um, yeah. Make Baptist. sure, make sure you look into First Baptist and what they are doing, because remember, each individual church within the convention is independent. The, the convention can't dictate to any of the churches how they are to run their church. So, and Pastor David's pushed back a lot, not just on the Southern Baptist Convention, but also on the Florida Baptist Convention as to how he wants the money to be allocated and where it does the best good. And I know the pastor's been more uh, focus on the money going to the missionaries than to supporting programs. You know what I mean? Yes. So if you ask Pastor Danny, I know that he said in the past, if you go to his office and ask him for a printout, like of what we're do where the monies are going to, like in the cooperative program or any other money. Yes, yeah, I plan on doing that or, or emailing him. Or okay, okay. That, that should answer your questions. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, good, Aaron. Good night, well, everybody. God bless you, my brother. Say good night. Give Thank him love you, to your family. Hey, you're good welcome, night, Mark. Good night, everybody. Good night, bro. Bye. Yep. Thank good you. Good night.
Happy I, Father's I, Day, everybody. Yeah, happy, happy Father's, Father's Day. Day. Happy Father's Day. Happy yes, Father's indeed. Day. Thank you. Indeed. Yeah. God yeah. bless you all. Yeah, good night, Doug, Gail. God bless you all. Yeah, good thank night. you. God bless. Yeah. Good night. Good night, Sherry. All right there, good night. Hey, thank good night, you. Martin. God bless. Give thank love you. to Wendy. Thank you. You got it, my brother. God bless you. And, and good night, Margaret. God bless you, my sister. And good night, Ted. Yeah, we'll we'll talk yeah. again on Wednesday. Wednesday. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> and we'll continue on with our soap opera, right? Right. <laughs> Sounds good. Sounds good. Chapters 48 and 49. Chapters 48 and 49. Yes, ma'am. And let's see what happens with the Jews in Egypt, especially with uh, Jacob's blessing to his sons. I think that that will be the most telling thing of what he, how he sees each of his sons. Yeah. Well, I'm glad you're feeling okay after your shot, Margaret. I, I know, I think Victor said you weren't feeling too well last night, but. Yeah, I was feverish. Yeah, that's what he said. Last night. Yeah, but you're feeling better now? Yes. Oh, good, good. I'm glad to hear that. Well, you have a good night, my sister. Okay, thank you. Okay, God bless you. God bless you. Yeah, bye-bye.